Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I miss seeing you all face to face. <laughs> talking on a webinar is always kind of like talking to a wall. <laughs> But um, I wanted to keep in touch. I want to make sure you guys kind of knew what was going on out there. Um, I know we're, we're all out there still working, doing our essential jobs. Um, and so it's, it's been a challenge to keep in communication. So thanks for taking the time to jump on with this. We're going to be talking for a good 45 minutes on kind of some of the pests and the solutions for the pests. Uh, but as you guys have questions, go ahead and enter them in. And we'll go ahead and recap them all at the end. So let's get started. And I'm going to start with the look-alike uh, pests and diseases because this has been kind of my nemesis right now. Um, my next webinar is actually on drought or not drought. Uh, that discussion is already beginning, though we've just come out of like a week worth of rain. But hey, let's enjoy this five days of sunshine while we can. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we get a lot of confusion between drought and pests or disease. And so <clears throat> drought symptoms are, are very easily kind of summed up. I mean, if you're lucky, you get the typical wilting, but rarely do we actually see that in, in tree material. Um, sometimes in a young growth or a new planting or transplant, we'll notice it, or tender new tissue, we'll really notice it. Um, but mo for the most part, drought tends to show up as dieback of the interior needles or the interior leaves of plant material. And it's usually an overall even effect in true drought conditions. Um, if someone creates an artificial drought symptom, such as chopping off all the roots on one side of the tree, then yes, sometimes we can actually see a one-sided effect, but usually it's evenly throughout the entire canopy and the plant material starts to abort the, the older needles or the older leaves. And so we get a thinning effect to the canopy. So always look for that. Because a lot of times you guys will talk to me or send me photos of a tree with a very thin canopy and always say, you know, send me a picture of the entire landscape so I can see what's going on. And, um, we'll notice that, yes, it's got a thin canopy, but part of that's because it's lost a lot of its old or interior growth. Um, and it's usually leading back to some sort of uh, root issue, whether it's we got some sort of disease in the roots, but the whole idea is those roots aren't functioning, they're not getting water, we get a drought symptom, and we see the interior needles or leaves aborting on the tree. So always take the time. If you've noticed that, go ahead, see if it's truly a drought, find out what the irrigation system is in the area what the irrigation has been over the last six months to a year, because we all know what happens when we shut off watering our drought, our drought uh, tolerant trees. They still show drought symptoms because they're used to us giving them water. So that being said, always try and identify this one first, ask the pertinent questions, check the irrigation, and see if you can eliminate this as one of the main issues. The other one that I get a lot is herbicide damage. <laughs> Honestly, this one has been coming up more and more ever since um, the whole glyphosate issue and people trying to avoid glyphosate. And now we're seeing all these other uh, herbicides being used out in the industry that maybe have a little less research or maybe uh, is some sort of organic product. Next thing we know, we're seeing a lot more tree damage. And one of the telltale signs always with herbicide damage is usually the leaves will curl upwards. They'll cup upwards when it tends to be herbicide damage. So that's kind of a quick telltale sign. Um, then you'll sometimes get salt burns depending on the type of chemical that was being used. Um, but the other thing you'll notice is it's usually not even. Like for instance, in the picture on the left, this was obviously a volatilization drift issue probably because one side of the tree is much more affected than the other side of the tree. So obviously maybe there's something that was done on that side and it drifted in and cause that damage. So usually it's, you tend to find it out on the new growth first, you tend to see it erratic through the tree, and you tend to see this cupping of the leaves. If you have noticed this, you know, start asking the site questions. You know, odds are you probably didn't do it, then maybe there was someone else on site who was or used something that ran off into the trees or something of that nature. Um, so start asking questions. Uh, the best one I had was a tree company was treating trees. And of course it was, you know, aphids, we had sticky honeydew, so we had sooty mold on the sidewalk. And they came in and power washed the sidewalks with some really nasty chemical. And when we came back and looked at the trees, all the leaves were cupped. So obviously we're having an herbicide effect of whatever chemical they're using to clean the sidewalk. So always ask the questions, see what's been going on, uh, and try and figure out if there's something you could do to mitigate the damage. Um, 
The other one is salt damage. This is the other one I, I tend to get a lot of calls on as to pest or disease issues. And honestly, with us using more and more reclaimed water, um, I start seeing more and more of this damage being perpetuated out. Um, usually you can see the burning on the margin of the leaves or the reddening the tips of um, conifers. Usually if you have reclaimed water, the first tree to suffer on your property would be the conifers. Uh, they tend to be more sensitive. You tend to get a yellowing of the overall canopy. And then in extreme cases of salt damage, you'll start getting that redding or tip burn uh, on the needles. So just kind of keep in mind, this is something that we've been, you know, battling against for a while now. Um, and, and the more we use uh, different methods of reduced irrigation, uh, the more salt buildup we can definitely see in our soils, the more we're going to see this issue coming up. And yes, every now and again, it is the result of an over fertilization. But um, honestly, that, that's usually the rare case when we see this. Um, so it's usually when someone's had drought stress plant material, they give it a lot of water, but with tons of fertilizer, <laughs> and they'll get this uh, burning effect. So know the difference, know how it looks a little bit different uh, than some of our disease and pests, uh, and uh, try and eliminate as this being an issue uh, to what you might be working with. So feel free to send me any questions you have about some of these symptoms that we've been seeing out there that have been getting confused. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of quickly go over a few of them so you guys had some ideas to look for these as well. So let's get into the pests and diseases of all. I'm actually going to start with the diseases because if I got your attention span for the first 15 minutes, <laughs> um, I want to make sure you guys know the disease one the best because this one is the most difficult to tell you the truth. And it's because you have to identify which chemical works for what disease. In pests, we say, you know, if it bores, you use this chemical. If it's you use a sucking piercing, you use this chemical. It's not the same way with fungicides and antibiotics. So the first one I'm going to talk about really quick, you guys probably know it, it's phosphagen. It's got the phosphorus acid. This is the one that we tend to use against cankers. It's very effective against Phytophthora cankers, Phytophthora root rot, um, different types of cankers, Botrysphaeria cankers. But the reason why I'm talking about this one is this is not a chemical that actually attacks the fungus itself. It actually stimulates the plant material to become hypersensitive and to protect itself against the fungus. So it's going to do things like thickening cell walls and making it more sensitive and compartmentalizing uh, compromised cells and things of that nature. So this one takes a while to react. So you might put this in a tree for, we'll say, a phytophthora canker on the trunk. And it's gonna take like six months for it to really kind of steal over and compartmentalize those compromised cells and stop that weeping. Because it only works as fast as the tree grows. So if a really old tree that's growing really slow, it could take longer. A young, vigorous tree might take less time. Uh, but usually when we use phosphorus, usually after a couple of weeks of application, you'll notice kind of a green effect, kind of a growth spurt almost in the canopy. So you do usually see some initial reaction fairly quickly but it takes a while for it to really go after the, that infection and, and truly protect itself. So that's the reason why I talk about this one. You always have to make sure you're well in advance of what's going on with this particular chemical. Propozol is different. It's an actual fungistat where it actually attacks the disease itself. So this is the one that tends to be used against more virulent diseases like Fusarium and Geosmithia and all that fun stuff out there. Um, so those are the two fungicides we use most commonly, and I'm going to go through, you know, which one's being used for what and which diseases and the timing on it. And then we have our one antibiotic that we use, uh, the Arbor OTC, which is made up of oxytetracycline. So this is the one that we're using against our bacterial infections. So we also have to be able to identify the difference between a bacterial infection and a fungal infection, which makes everything even more a little bit complicated. So <clears throat> let's start with fire blight. So that's always the first thing we treat for come spring. And if you haven't done it yet, you probably missed most of your window, um, unfortunately. And it was mainly because we had that early warm February where everything started to want to pop and push early. And the problem is, is the way this is designed to work is this fungal disease becomes, or sorry, bacterial infection becomes active when uh, it starts to get our cold, rainy weather. So it's most active in our January, February, March, April. Um, and so the chemical that we use, Arbor OTC, 
actually suppresses that disease during that period of time. So it's not curing the infection, but it's suppressing the disease itself from spreading and causing the dieback. And so usually we have, you know, January, February, and even the first week of March to get these applications done prior to the, leaf, the tree starting to leaf out and push the new growth. And unfortunately this year, it happened a little quickly and then with all the chaos of what's going on out there, um, I know we've missed uh, quite a few applications on this one. Or if you got them in late and you already had kind of leaf expansion, you might see some breakthrough on that early tissue push uh, and you might still see some death and die back from it. But usually if, if you take the time to prune out all the dead the fall prior, um, you don't see any dieback that following spring after this application. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. Uh, the timing on this one's pretty much past. Uh, there's not a whole lot we can do but spray to our best ability to try and suppress this disease at this point in time. Um, I do have some people doing late applications with the spray combination. Um, we'll, we'll see how that works out and see if we can suppress this uh, early spring. So you always got to watch out for treating for this one. If it's early spring, if we get an early spring, uh, odds are we can be caught off guard. So I tend to start reminding, sending out emails like, hey, it's December, start planning for your OTC applications uh, as just to get you guys thinking about it in advance so you can kind of hit more of that late January window as opposed to waiting when we could possibly have an early spring. So, and this was a question I just got recently. We always talk about sterilizing uh, the pruning equipment. Um, yes, still always sterilize your pruning equipment and it's partly because the customers at this point even know you're supposed to be sterilizing your pruning equipment. Even though research has now come out saying it really doesn't make that much of a difference, um, I still recommend you do it because the customers always find a reason that, you know, they don't want to pay because they didn't see you sterilize your equipment. Um, and unfortunately, that, that's a battle we're, we're going to have for a while. So I do still recommend sanitizing your equipment when you're out there doing your pruning cuts. Um, and if it does happen to help vector a tiny bit less, then by all means, that's one more win for the books. But um, do please try and keep doing that, even though we've seen research that says you, you really don't need to. Okay. If you guys have any more questions on fire blight, feel free to send me an email, text, or raise your hand or put a note into the, the comments column. But I'm going to move on to Botrysphyria canker now because this is the one that starts getting mixed up with fire blight. So fire blight comes out in the spring, the cold rainy months, and then Botrysphyria canker, which is a fungal infection, comes out in the warm summer months. But I tend to get this callback from people on pear trees that say, hey, it's June, I have fire blight back, you know, the application didn't work. Well, by June, fire blight has pretty much gone dormant in the trees. So if we're seeing new instances of dieback, odds are it's the Botrysphyria canker. Um, so there's a way you can tell pretty easily the difference between the two besides when it's occurring in the year, is if you look at the branch material, you'll actually see the cankers or the lesions uh, where the Botrysphyria is actually occurring. And so that way you can identify very quickly, okay, this is what's girdled and killed this branch, this is why the branch is dead and has the leaves still hanging on it. So you sometimes have to actually point that out to the customer and explain the difference because this one we use the phosphajet against. And so because we're using the phosphorus on it, we have to do it earlier, right? So we have to be doing it in spring if we want to protect for, you know, late, late spring and early summer. Um, what I tend to recommend is if you don't know if your pear tree has fire blight and botrysphyria, you just know it's suffering greatly, you might want to do a combination application. Uh, inject both the uh, Arbor OTC and then the phosphorus uh, phosphogen right after to make sure you take care of both infections in the tree. And that way you won't get any of that late season dieback from the Botrysphyria canker. Um, that being said, if we are going into another drought, my suspicion is we're going to see a real jump in Botrysphyria canker again, like we did in the last drought. Um, so keep that in mind. I was kind of hoping that we'd see a reduced instance of fire blight because of our nice warm February months where we tend to see more fire blight activity. Um, with this later rain and still cold temperatures, I don't know if we're going to see that kind of reactivation of fire blight. So with any luck, we'll see a reduction of fire blight, 
but without rain, we'll probably see more botrysphyria. So start kind of looking a little bit closer on your pears to tell a difference. But botrysphyria canker will get on your sycamore trees, your liquid amber trees. We'll get in a lot more trees than just uh, pear trees. So any questions on the bot canker, feel free, let me know. I'm going to move on to Dutch elm disease. And that's because I'm putting all the diseases that I get calls that look alike together. And Dutch elm disease looks a lot like fire blight and it looks a lot like botrysphyria canker. Why? Because we get that dead branch, that random dead branch that the leaves hang on to. Um, but this one is only in our elms, mainly our American elms. Um, so if someone happens to call you and says, I have fire blight, and you go out and you look and you see it's an elm tree, you're like, hmm, let's look a little deeper into this. And you'll probably see boreholes from possibly the vectoring beetle from this particular disease. And again, when you pull the branch and you look at the branch itself, you're not going to find that canker or lesion. You're going to see this uh, complete kind of vascular uh, deterioration going on. So with a little investigative work, you can tell the difference of what you're dealing with. Uh, but the tree type is your first indicator. <clears throat> and of course, to top it all off, it's a totally different chemical again. So we got Arbor OTC for fire blight, we got Foxajet for botrysphyria canker, and for Dutch elm disease, we use the propozole. Um, so you kind of have to identify what's going on to know which is the right chemical to be using with it. And Dutch elm disease, you know, it, it hasn't been popular. We haven't really seen a whole lot of it, except for in the last couple years. It's really creeping back up again. Any of you guys working out of the San Jose, uh, Monterey area, we've seen a huge influx in it. And we've also seen a big influx up in Sacramento, just been showing up in San Diego. So it's, it's throughout the state. It's kind of uh, interesting the way it's kind of making its comeback, a disease that we kind of thought was somewhat uh, cycled out and dead and gone uh, is not accurate in this case. So keep your eye out for this. If you notice dead and declining branches, do a little investigative work. The problem with this one is it doesn't just vector by the beetle. Uh, so you can treat and protect and kill the beetles and stop the beetles from infesting new trees. But this one can also be vectored by root grafts. If you have an elm next to another elm and they've grafted the roots, they can just pass it with root grafts. So uh, this one is much more difficult. Um, part of the reason why we use the propozole. It is an injection that we do every two years. And you pretty much have to do it for the life of the tree while it has, that it has the infection. So the whole goal is once you get one of these trees, if it is one of your you know, kind of iconic trees, you want to hold on to it, by all means you're treating it. Uh, if not, uh, you definitely kind of want to remove it and get it out of the area. So that's Dutch elm disease. Do a little more research on it because it, it definitely seems to be making a bit of a comeback. Okay, and then anthracnose. That's the other one we all tend to want to treat for in spring. Um, honestly, if you're doing trunk injection, you really should be doing fall applications. Um, <clears throat> if you're doing fall applications, you can use the phosphajet on the western sycamore. It works great. And when you do that, you also take care of any instances of the botrysphyria canker that might be cropping up in the tree. Um, but if you missed your fall application, then I really recommend you go to the propozole in early spring on your sycamores. Uh, just know you'll, you'll probably still get symptoms of your bot canker unless you do a combination treatment of propozole and phos. Um, but if you're dealing with something other than a western sycamore, like maybe you have ash anthracnose or oak anthracnose or elm anthracnose, they all get anthracnose, um, you're going to want to use propozole on those, not the phosphorus. Propozole works much better on the different species of trees like that against the anthracnose. And yes, you can do it in the spring. Um, just know that some, some of our, like, uh, plant material is a little more sensitive with new tissue growth in spring, so I still tend to recommend fall if you can. A lot of times when I'm, I'm dealing with uh, nutrient issues or I'm dealing with anthracnose, I tend to really want to get those done in the fall. Um, spring is kind of your fallback when you didn't have enough time, or if you just finally get the job and get it booked, then by all means, spring. But keep in mind, um, propozole is a pretty thick liquid. So getting it in early spring before you have leaf expansion can be very difficult. Um, and that's when we really want to be doing our spring applications. It's kind of that bud expansion. You want to really get it prior to leaf out so that way you can get all the plant material protected. So 
With that being said, this is probably the one I get the most confusion on of what the timing is and what the chemical is. Can you use propozole in Western Sycamore? Yes. Um, I just kind of recommend doing the phosphorus so you can get two uh, infections with one shot on the Western Sycamore with the bot canker and the anthracnose. So fall applications if you can. If not, uh, go to spring and, and go to the propozole material. Okay, and then we get into sudden oak death. So sudden oak death, we tend to recommend during the rainy season. And so, you know, our rainy season is supposed to start about the, you know, first week of October-ish. Uh, sometimes not until November, but usually we say start doing your applications on oaks when the rain starts falling. So we say that because a lot of times our oaks are in a rangeland, they don't have irrigation. In order for them to move the chemical, they need water. So we got to wait for the rain to give them the water so they can move the chemical. So with sudden oak death, this one we tend to recommend do it November through March because that's usually when we expect our, our most uh, rainfall at that point in time. And we know the chemical will move well in the tree. Uh, if you're doing a bark spray, it's an every year application. Um, <clears throat> and we tend to recommend that only for the smaller diameter trees. Once you get up above a 12 or 18 inch diameter oak tree that gets very thick bark, and sometimes at that point we start having lichen and moss growing on it and dirt's accumulated. And it gets very difficult to get good penetration uh, in thick barked older oak trees. So young ones, not a problem. You can do a bark spray. Uh, that label is actually on the phosphajet label as well. And then you can uh, do trunk injection for the older, more mature trees. And that trunk injection will last two years. So a lot of times if you're going onto a property, uh, you know, evaluate what you have there. If they're large, mature, go ahead and do the injections. If they're smaller, go ahead and do the bark spray. Um, but you're going to come back and do that bark spray every year and trunk injections every two years. Once we get out into more of the May-June timeframe, we say stop with the sudden oak death applications. Um, don't do any additional watering. These oaks tend not to prefer it. So if we are in a drought situation, uh, you want to consider watering your oaks now uh, during the time when we have reduced irrigation and reduced rain as opposed to giving them summer water. So that just can perpetuate the problem with sun milk death with them. We don't want late season rain or late season water with our oaks uh, when it comes to dealing with sudden oak death. All right, moving on. Powdery mildew. My gosh, I get a lot of questions about powdery mildew as of late. Why? Because the last two years we have gotten rain in June. Rain in June pretty much guarantees a powdery mildew issue. Uh, so sycamores, oaks, crepe myrtles, they're probably the three most common ones I get. Um, and so the, we have a myriad of products you can use for it, but there, there's caveats to all of it. So I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the Eco One product line, uh, but that's a 25B product line, meaning it doesn't require EPA registration. It's made from botanicals. Um, this does have a curative effect to powdery mildew, but not in massive infestations. Uh, we prefer to do a preventative if you can, but it is a spray application. Um, so you can start to notice it, that's the time to spray it. You want to knock it back before it has a chance to establish. If it establishes, then you move into the propozole, again, as a spray, because powdery mildew being a topical infection uh, is not well controlled as a trunk injection methodology against it. So we will spray propozole uh, to combat powdery mildew uh, on plant material. And then there's kind of a, a third option, which is what we call kind of thinking outside the box. And if any of you guys have looked at the full webinar schedule, I highly recommend you see uh, Corey Lofty's presentation on PGRs and shortstop, because uh, it'll kind of open your eyes to PGRs and what they can do. Uh, we've always started using shortstop because of drought conditions. And then we found all these other attributes to using a plant growth regulator. Now, don't let me confuse you. This is an anti-fruiting. Nope, if you put down shortstop, if anything, you will get more fruit. So don't mix up the two. Um, but because of reducing the canopy growth, it actually causes the, the leaves to become thicker and smaller and get a, a stronger cuticle layer, uh, which makes in fungal infections, topical fungal infections, more difficult. Uh, so if you are working with plant material where you wouldn't mind a few more flowers, um, go ahead. You can use shortstop as a plant growth regulator as a soil drench. Uh, to actually reduce those fungal infections on plant materials. And you do that uh, once every two years. So just another way of thinking outside the box of how we can kind of thwart 
uh, powdery mildew uh, without being a chunk injectable application. So I know I've had a lot more questions on this one. Feel free to contact me later if you have any instances where you want specific directions. Okay, let's get into the pests and diseases. So you guys kind of know our whole line of products that we use. Uh, triage, we now have three versions of it, the original triage, the RUP, the general use G4, and now we have triage R10, which again is restricted use, uh, but the great part is it's twice the concentration, so we only have to put half as much product in the tree. And even better, it's got a label that says we can mix it with propozole. So if you are working with a pest disease complex, uh, it's a great product to be working in to really reduce your labor. And then of course we have Imaget and Imaget 10. Again, it's a, dif a difference of concentration. Imaget is 5%, Imaget 10 is 10%. And then we have our Azosol, which is our organic Omri uh, product, which can be uh, injected, sprayed, drenched, chemigated, myriad way of applying. And then of course, my favorite chemical, as all you guys know, I always talk about HJET, which is acephate, which if you guys have been in the industry for a while, you remember it as orthine, but uh, it's just got a really, really fast uh, control. Uh, methodology with it. So it'll usually knock pests out of the tree in about 24 to 48 hours, uh, which is key for making customers happy because um, everybody wants to see instant results, right? Uh, so just keep in mind, it's got a very short residual, so you're almost always piggybacking something with HJET. You'll put the HJET in first, let it race ahead, and then you'll put something like ImageJet in behind it to get a year's control, or if it's caterpillars or something, you'll put in triage behind it to get two years control. So kind of keep that in mind when working with uh, my favorite product of HJET. Okay, let's talk about aphids, because that is usually the first thing we're really treating for uh, come spring. And we have already started to see aphid populations uh, blossoming. We can thank our nice warm February for that. So keep this in mind, when we're dealing with aphids, uh, you can, if it's a light infestation, you can try knocking them down with the organic Omri product. Um, but if you're going to trunk inject, I really recommend going with imidacloprid. It gives you the whole year of control. Um, keep in mind, though, if you inject in spring, so say now or what, we'll call we're in early February at this point or early April, you'll probably be protected for an entire year and probably through the following spring. So you'll get a nice, good, long control on it during, doing it during this time of year. But if say you're trying to get ahead of work because you know this one property always gets aphids, uh, inject in the fall and you'll be protected from fall to the following fall. Um, so that way you'll get a good year's control in there. And then the aphid, of course, if for some reason the customer is freaking out about the honeydew that's following, um, they want it to stop immediately, you know, go ahead, lead with the ace jet first and then uh, follow with the imidacloprid. And that way you can get quick knockdown and long residual. And if for some reason you're working with any sort of uh, basswood or tilia species, which cannot be used, midacloprid and neonics can't be used on those species of trees, uh, we recommend the ace jet followed by the azosol combination uh, for treatment of those tree types in particular. So, and if you happen to be running up against a flowering tree, by all means, remember, we're not supposed to be injecting a midacloprid or any neonic or spraying, spraying or drenching or any sort of neonic during flowering uh, trees that are flowering. So aphids, still number one most treated for pest. But funny, the one that's coming up right behind it is scale. Um, <clears throat> right now, probably the most common calls I get are for, you know, the tulip tree scale, which is now in the magnolias. Um, that's probably going to be the number one. Ficus scale is pretty high up there as well. And then sycamore scale, people still tend to look overlook that one quite a bit just because they're dealing with anthracnose and botkinks and sycamores. So the biggest thing about dealing with scales is you gotta know whether you're dealing with hard scale or soft scale. Hard scale is more difficult to treat. The midacloprid won't touch it. Um, so you have to make sure you're using acephate with the midacloprid to take care of your hard scale. So um, the most challenging scale I think that I have found to treat is the cottony scale, the cottony cushion scale. That one's brutal. Uh, it's really been getting into a lot of our citrus trees. Um, we've been seeing it actually, where do we see it? It was on a cypress, it was on a Monterey cypress. Um, anyway, it's one of those things. This scale is really starting to get around. It's very difficult. And it's such a profuse feeder that you see decline in the trees very quickly. So make sure if you do identify it, you start treating it immediately, start trying to knock it down. Um, 
Azathol and the citrus works well. Um, if I'm going into any other tree type and going after this scale, I'm definitely leading with my ace jet. Uh, definitely getting that in there first, and then uh, I'll put the image jet in behind it to make sure it goes after the crawlers as well. But if I'm just dealing with the soft scale, like for instance, sycamore scale, uh, imidacloprid will be fine for that. Image jet 10, do it in the fall when you're doing your phosphorus application. You'll take care of both the scale and the, the, the fungal infection as well. So keep in mind if you have that instance where you may have treated for aphids, and you get that call back that there is still honeydew falling, and you go back out and you don't find any aphids, look deeper. Start looking at the twigs, the petioles, and start looking for that scale. Um, odds are uh, it might be the one who's actually truly producing that honeydew, and then you have to go ahead and use a product that's going to work against that particular scale. So by all means, send me photos. I'm more than happy to look at photos and tell you which chemicals you should be using for what pests. And then if you're looking at the tree and you don't see any sort of, you know, scale, then look closer and maybe the thing causing the honeydew is actually mites. Um, so keep in mind, metacloprid does not work on spider mites. Uh, so if you have had a property that's been getting a lot of metacloprid over the years, odds are you've probably built up a mite population. You, sometimes you'll see the webbing uh, on the leaves, base of the petioles, um, the needles of pines, um, an easy test is just take a white piece of paper and tap it onto your, uh, uh, tap the branch above it, and they'll usually knock off and you'll be able to identify them pretty quickly on that white piece of paper. But um, in order to be treating for this one, we usually we tend to say ace jet. And the reason is, is by the time you guys tend to get the call about these or notice that it's going on, you probably have a pretty decent uh, mite population and you're already noticing the stippling and the feeding damage on the foliage. Uh, and the interior leaders are probably starting to drop. So redwoods are probably one of the most common ones up in the north uh, that we usually get very late identification once the tree is looking very stressed. So we want to get a very fast acting chemical in there. So we'll lead with that ace jet by all means to knock out that pest population that's currently feeding. Um, you can use uh, the triage G4 as well. Keep in mind, it, it takes a good six weeks to kind of get circulated through the canopy to knock down that pest. Uh, so you might still want to lead with the ace jet if you're going to go do that. And then the tree will be protected for a couple years against mites if you use the triage product. So when dealing with these mites, um, we tend to see them start feeding at this time, but we don't tend to notice the damage until it starts starting to get a little warm. And that's usually because that's when the trees are trying to store more stress, they're trying to pull more water, and they're having issues because they have this pest feeding on them. So keep in mind, start looking for them now. Uh, granted, I know it's hard when it's raining, um, but uh, you'll, you'll start noticing pretty early once our rain stops. So that's the other one. That's the one that tends to get overlooked uh, aside from scale and tends to all get lumped into the same category with aphids. And unfortunately, since the midocloprid doesn't work on this, uh, if you go out trying to control them with an aphid control program, you're not going to be successful. Okay. And then, of course, I'm going to talk about my red gum lerfstillids and tortoise beetles on the eucalyptus trees, because I'm still trying to get all of you guys out there to treat the eucalyptus trees. I know. I keep telling you guys to make up about 20% of our urban canopy out here, uh, but still, it, it's hard to get people to treat them. I know. The nice part is, though, is it doesn't matter if you have just lerfstillids or if you have lerfstillids and tortoise beetles. Imidacloprid works great. The Imaget products, I tend to say use Imaget 10. And that's just because odds are it's a big, huge diameter eucalyptus tree. And uh, to save your hand a little uh, wear and tear, uh, you can put the half the chemical in with the Imaget 10. Uh, so I tend to recommend that. And um, if you kind of need those immediate results, I still say lead with the ACE jet. Um, I know it's difficult because it's a, it's a large tree. There's usually a lot of injection sites. So to go around with two chemicals, it does have a bit of a labor effect. Um, but it, it does make a huge difference. You'll see those tortoise beetles literally dropping out of the tree as they're feeding. So keep that in mind when you do this. Um, you will have beetles dropping probably down your shirt. So be aware of that. I always say wear a hooded jacket when doing it because the time it takes you to get all the way around that tree, it's, it's already flowing and being effective on some of those beetles. And then follow with the uh, image at 10 right behind it. And you can take out that lerpsoid, you can take out the tortoise beetle, and the one that I don't have on here but will also be taken out is the uh, eucalyptus longhorn borer. And that's the one that we tend to see ultimately cause this kind of fatal decline 
of the eucalyptus trees. They get in there and do significant damage to the vascular tissue of the tree, and that's when we tend to see the whole tree starting to die out. So please, please feel free, treat a tree for me, just, just one eucalyptus tree. I'll take anything I can get. All right, <clears throat> and this is the one that the calls are starting, we're all starting to plan for this, but I have a lot of confusion out in the industry about the difference between oak worm and tussock moth. So on your left, you have oak worm. Um, these guys are uh, kind of more what we call smooth body. They don't have a whole lot of hairs or anything on them. Uh, we tend to see them have two life cycles in a year. So we tend to see them come out in June, come out again in the fall. Uh, whereas the tussock moth, the one on the right, that you can see has lots of hairs on it, um, those tend to come out earlier. So those are usually the ones we're treating early for. Um, so know the difference so you can kind of know the different timing on these. Um, and the other thing is, is the oak worm pretty much stays on the coast. We don't tend to see that go into warmer climates. Uh, we don't see it in the valley, um, but we will see the tussock moth. Um, we treat for both of them because both of them have that feeding effect where they try and completely defoliate the oaks. And our poor oaks are already stressed enough as it is. We don't want to add any more stressors of being defoliated by these pests. Uh, the other reason why we see a lot of treatment on the tussock moth is because the, mo uh, the, the larvae itself, the hairs on it, um, actually cause allergic reactions in a lot of people. So if they happen to be in a public place like Stanford parking lot, you know, details, um, it can be an extreme nuisance uh, at that point, or if they're in parks or some sort of public area. So the treatment is the same. Um, if you have the pest actively feeding on the tree, you have to use ace jet because you've got to get that chemical moving through the tree immediately to start knocking the pests on down. But keep in mind, even if a tree has been treated with ace jet, you are still going to get the presence of the pest uh, because they have to feed in order to ingest the chemical to die. So I, I have people going, but I, but I treated the tree, and I still see them on there. Well, yep, not until they get the chemical do they die. And uh, that's how we lower and crash the population. So you can also use uh, the triage for this, pro this problem. But the thing is, is like I said, it, it can take six weeks to circulate throughout a tree, so you have to get it in way ahead of when these pests are going to be feeding. And honestly, the tussock moths are about to start feeding probably soon if we haven't already seen some of the damage. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, we would be way too late at this point. But if you chose to inject the ACE jet to knock down the pest that's feeding right now, you could do the same day, same time, inject the triage right behind it and get the, the year of the control. So when you're dealing with it, kind of evaluate the situation, see if it's worthwhile. If it's one of the pests that, you know, really only one cycle a year, maybe you just go in with the ace jet. Um, you can start crashing the population just by getting the feed and die, um, as opposed to, you know, right now we, we've heard a lot of knocking out the tree with water and, and just about everything else. Unfortunately, you're going to continue having that population and you're not going to get control of it. So by all means, use the ace jet and help reduce that population and get it out of the area. So if you have questions on which one you're dealing with, uh, let me know. Um, a photo, pretty easy to tell the difference between the two of them. Uh, but yeah, any questions on timing, let me know, or a chemical, more than happy to answer. And then I wanted to go over thrips and whitefly, our mobile pests that really start showing up in spring. Um, I've had a lot of issues with identification on this one. So the biggest one that tends to be misidentified is kind of that, that, uh, that instar state that's on the backside of oak leaves. They're black with a little white around the edge. That's white fly. Um, I get a lot of people asking if it's scale or something going on. Nope, it's white fly. Um, so the other one that we have in the area is a spiraling white fly. It's not the same as the Rugo spiraling white fly that was down in Florida that, you know, pretty much made everyone go insane by the honeydew that it was producing. Uh, but if you see this circular kind of white egg laying pattern, that is a spiraling white fly. And again, uh, we need to be able to treat for it. Um, the problem with thrips and white flies is they're mobile pests. And uh, if we don't have a high enough concentration in the plant material, they may fly to a spot where there is no chemical, they feed, they multiply, and we don't reduce the population and we build up resistance. So
So the biggest thing I've noticed is a lot of people would talk about the myoporum thrips and how you could try and use imidacloprid on them and it didn't do anything. Um, we get great results injecting for myoporum thrips. Um, it's that concentration that creates the difference. Um, and I have to admit, someone sent me the best photo of a close-up of a thrip. And, I mean, this thing kind of looked like a scorpion. It had its back, its tail turned uh, up, and I was just like, what is this? And all of a sudden, when you put it in perspective, I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's a thrip. Shoot, that thing looks much scarier when it's large. <laughs> so uh, keep that in mind when dealing with thrips as well. It's the same thing. It's a mobile pest. Um, and they really distort leaf tissue. So trying to do any sort of spray is, is darn near impossible to actually do some control with this particular one. Um, so again, I say lead with the ace jet. Uh, you're going to get that fast knockdown, uh, especially while they're out there feeding. If you're doing a fall application of this and they're not out there feeding, there is absolutely no reason to lead with the ace jet. Um, so if you are doing fall work, just use the imidacloprid. But if you're doing spring applications for it, uh, the best thing to do is do the combination treatment of ACE jet followed by the Imajet. Uh, and that way you'll knock down immediately and you'll get that residual. And you won't get that damaged tissue look. Um, so I know ficus trees and ficus whitefly. Ficus trees are hard to inject. I don't know if you guys have been out there and done it. But because of that backflow pressure of the latex, um, it's one of those things where you almost want to have two systems set up and injecting, as in, you drill, you put your plug in, you inject your ACE jet, you pull the needle, you go in with the next injector, and you inject the imidacloprid. If you wait until you go around the tree and you try and come back to those same sites with the imidacloprid, you're going to have a very difficult time getting it in. Uh, so that's the only issue that we really see when treating for ficus with doing the double uh, treatment, uh, chemical treatment. So if you can, by all means, do a fall application of imidacloprid uh, for a ficus whitefly. You'll get ahead of it and you won't have to do the double application. So when dealing with white flying thrips, identify it correctly. Um, we've gotten a few interesting diagnoses lately, and then we've got to make sure we get that full chemical coverage in there so we can actually knock down this pest. Okay, I'm running out of time, so I'm closing it up. So western bark beetle, again, this is something I see a lot of treatments for in spring. Oh, if I could get you guys, please inject in fall. It really is easier to do the injections, and it gives that chemical plenty of time to circulate through around the tree uh, and protect the tree come spring. Because we saw hit sites the second week of February. So those beetles were out and active by the second week of February. So when we come out and try and do our spring applications and the beetles are already flying, you may do your injection application, but it's going to take about mm, five six weeks to get that chemical to circulate. So if you are in a high pressure area, uh, by all means, do your injection. And if you have to, do the trunk spray as well. Uh, that way, uh, you're going to protect that tree while the chemical is circulating. And by the time the chemical is done circulating, the tree will be protected from the inside out from those beetles as well. So yes, I see a lot of spring applications for bark beetles. But if you can, do them in fall. Uh, especially if you're dealing with a blue stain fungus that might also be in the trees and you're adding in uh, propozole, uh, fall applications are so much easier. Fair warning. But the nice part is, and I will say this is one slight blessing, I guess you could call it, uh, is now with triage R10, putting in half a concentration, oh, it's a lot easier to get chemical into pine trees. Uh, I actually have people using the handheld quick jet now uh, to inject pine trees with triage, which we would have never dreamed of. Um, at the lower concentrations. It was just too high of a volume to get in. But now with R10, it's, it's actually doable. So if you can, please try and do these applications in the fall. If you have to, do them in the spring if that's when you get called out there. Um, but, but just know the ideal time for this really is fall. Same for the engraver beetle. Uh, the Ips engraver beetle is what we see more in our urban canopy than uh, the actual western or mountain pine beetle. Um, these are slightly easier to treat for because they tend to kill branches and not the entire tree straight off. Uh, so we get better indicator signs of here's a dead branch, there's a dead branch, we can inject and protect and save this tree. Um, but again, it's one of those situations where we tend to not see the dead branch damage until summer. So we already know we're behind the eight ball, that the beetles are already out flying, uh, there's already damage to the trees. Uh, so if you can and you get called out on a job and they say, hey, look, we got some dead branches, it's not looking so healthy, 
you know, get them scheduled in for an immediate application. And if you can work ahead on other properties or other trees on the property, you know, go ahead and get those done in the fall. So there's plenty of time for that uh, process to circulate through the tree and protect the tree. Okay, the last kind of borer I want to talk about is the bronze birch borer. This one we tend to always see late spring more. It's not really our early spring pest. Is it active in early spring? Yes. Do we notice it in early spring? Pretty much never. Um, so keep that in mind with this guy. He only attacks birch trees. He attacks all types of birch trees. There is not a birch tree he won't attack, though he does have his favorites, of course. Um, the real identifier for this guy is the D-shaped exit hole. He's a flat head borer. So when he goes out, he exits the tree, he leaves this nice flat D-shaped marker. So you can identify him pretty quick. So if you see a birch tree with a D-shaped exit hole, odds are you got this guy. He's now infesting all of California. So where we thought all of our trees are dying from drought, nope, they're actually dying from the birch borer. So look for this guy, pull the bark, you'll see the galleries. If you're just preventatively doing this and you don't see any birch borer in the area, full drench of imidacloprid works great. If you have them in the trees and the branches, uh, you definitely want to use an injection version of imidacloprid, use the Imaget 10. Um, and if you've already had a tree in the area die, or you have them in the main trunk, you definitely need to move up to the triage uh, product. Um, you, you get much better results and longer residuals uh, against that. And so kind of keep that in mind. You have different stages. Where you identify it at depends and kind of dictates what chemical and what treatment options you have. Um, but once you let it get too far gone, you're, you, you have to pretty much go to the triage products to, to mitigate this particular pest. So. The nice part is you can crash the populations, and because it can have a two-year life cycle, uh, you can really get them moved out of an area pretty quick. You just have to pay attention and kind of know what you're looking for, and it's that D-shaped exit hole. That's your trigger. So keep your eye out for this guy. Um, he's all throughout the state, and he's the one who's pretty much killing our birch trees, which we tend to say it's drought, or they've had their life cycle, right? 30 years birch, that's pretty good for California. Well, they can go longer when this guy is not around, so keep an eye out for this one. And then I just did a presentation on the gold spotted oak borer, so I'm not going to talk too much on this. If you really want, I got a whole webinar on it. Um, and uh, But the treatments for this one pretty much is uh, either the Imaget or the triage. Uh, Imaget, Forest Service says, will last you two years. I don't agree with that statement. Imaget will pretty much last you one year. I would not count on the second year uh, with the imidacloprid in, injected into a tree. Um, if you want two years to protect against this particular pest, you really need to move to the triage. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. And right now, check your live oaks, check your canyon oaks, check your black oaks, uh, but just know that they don't only attack those types of oaks. Those are just the main ones that we document them on. Uh, but they do have the ability to get into other trees. So watch for that canopy thinning. If you see the canopy thinning, look for that beautiful bug there with the six gold spots on its back. Inherent to its name, problem is they're really hard to identify out in the wild. So um, just look for those D-shaped exit holes. Another one of those flat borers that create that D-shaped exit hole when they leave the tree. And then last but not least, of course, we have our dear sweet invasive shaw hole borer who is still currently in Southern California, San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties. Uh, we still don't have it uh, documented as being infested into any of the Northern counties. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, this is more of a Southern California pest, but I would like for everyone just to keep their eyes out. If you see anything that looks like that tiny little beetle there about the size of a grain of rice, or those tiny little boreholes about the size of a, uh, the lead of a mechanical pencil, and they show up in a mass attack of weeping and staining on a tree, odds are that could be our invasive shot hole borer. And since there's no quarantine on this particular pest, it is gonna move throughout California. It's only a matter of time for someone to ship it someplace and let it infest. So don't mean to be a Debbie Downer on this one, but unfortunately that's how we saw it moving to Santa Barbara counties and San Luis Obispo counties. And uh, if we are truly getting into another drought situation, uh, though this pest prefers healthy trees, uh, it definitely seems to be uh, helped by drought stress uh, to get it moving and uh, reproducing more uh, quickly, we'll say. Um, if you're doing a preventative, you can get away with just using the insecticide. But once you have that 
plant or that pest in the tree and it's vectored in that fungus that causes the weeping, then you also have to add in the propozole. So keep that in mind on this one. Uh, this is one of those combination applications where I talked about it's great, the fact that triage R10 can be mixed with propozole. Uh, we can mix them and inject them one time, again, going after the pest and the disease itself. So, and this is the disease that I was talking about, the fusarium. Uh, we use the propozole against it. Um, we tend to say that if the tree is already highly infested, the vascular tissue cannot move the product. So keep in mind, feel free, watch the webinar. I kind of go through and break down what we call, you know, a lightly infested tree, a moderately infested tree, and a highly infested tree. So if you see a tree like this that is highly infested, highly infested, um, we can't treat and save those. We have to have an intact vascular tissue in order to protect against this particular pest and disease. Okay, so the reason why I talk about chlorosis in spring is because we do have some uh, nutritional supplements we inject, uh, MNJET SE and PalmJET. And the reason why I bring this up is because if you do a correct spring application, when the tree is just leafing out, um, there's no issues. You get this beautiful difference of a nice bright green tree. Um, my best example of this, as you can see, was from Colorado. So they injected right when the, why am I saying they? I injected right when the buds were expanding. And then three weeks later when the trees leafed out, you can see the one on the left I treated was just gorgeous. The one on the right still looked horrible and they ended up cutting down and removing it because apparently it was too much work to inject the other one. I'm just saying. Anyway, <laughs> so, but the problem is, is if you wait until you have bud expansion to do your application of micronutrients in spring, this is what can happen. So these trees had already leafed out and then a micronutrient injection was done and the leaf cuticle was still too soft. And so you get this burning effect. So you can't really see it too well in the left, but this whole section of this tree was, was scorched uh, from just too high a level of micronutrients in, in an unprotected leaf, basically. And this is kind of what it looks like a close up. You, you get this really kind of, well, kind of an interesting effect. Um, and the tree survives it. Trees don't die of this. They just look unsightly. Sometimes they'll abort the leaves. And usually when they release, they're, they're nice and green. But in the meantime, nobody wants to see this happen to their tree. So it's really, really important. If you're going to do micronutrients, do it before the leaves start expanding. Do it just at bud expansion. You'll be fine. If not, wait till later in the, the late to spring, early summer when the leaf cuticle is fully hardened, and then do your micronutrient application. So the other thing I want to talk about with palm jet is if you're going to be injecting palms, which is a great way to get them their nutrients that they need, um, you have to make sure you apply in temperatures below 80 degrees. So if you are going to be injecting palms for nutrients, now is the time. Uh, once we start getting hot, start getting to our warmer spring temperatures, you don't want to continue doing it. And it's just because you run the risk of giving uh, marginal burn uh, in, in high temperatures. You got to think that's a very reduced canopy up there, very little plant material on top of the palms. Uh, so if it gets hot temperatures, we'd run the risk of getting some burning uh, with that. So it's very important we stay in cool temperatures. So I say early spring, fall is your best time to do nutrient applications on palm trees. And then watering. You know me, I'm always stressing it. Water's the most important thing. We're relying on the tree's vascular tissue to move these products. Their vascular tissue has zero water. They are doing zero movement of our products. So it's really important, try and get a little water in beforehand. It'll save you the applicator time. The injections will go easier. And then afterwards, give them some water. But always remember, tell them exactly how much water to give them. If you give customers free reign on watering their trees, odds are they will drown them and you'll be back there doing root rot treatment. So keep that in mind. Always tell them how to do the watering. And then last but not least, if you're gonna take the time to water the tree, Use the Nutri-Root product. That's the one that's got the humates and humectants in it that helps hold that water in the root zone of the tree. Um, and of course, it's got other micronutrients and kelps and everything else that helps fortify the trees. So if you're going to take the time to water a tree, always add this in. It's a great benefit to trees. And uh, yeah, that's a quick plug for the Nutri-Root. But that's all I have for you guys today. I've got to keep it under an hour. Um, if you have any questions, feel free, type them in. If not, this is my contact information more than happy to answer any questions you might have. So thank you very much.